Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's webcast titled Autodesk Inventor Frame Analysis and Eco-Materials Advisor. Today's presenter is Marvin Thomas, Solutions Engineer with Hagerman & Company. This presentation is being broadcasted in a listen-only mode. You can ask questions by typing them into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your screen, and Marvin will address those at the end of his presentation. At the end of the broadcast, when you exit GoToWebinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a short three-question survey. We ask that you take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. Lastly, all attendees will receive a certificate of attendance and a link to the recording of this presentation. Marvin, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marvin Thomas. Um, I am the MCAD Solutions Engineer here at Hagerman. And today we're going to take a little bit, a look at uh, frame analysis and equal material visor uh, with Inventor. Um, uh, first, let's talk about digital prototyping. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of this before. Uh, excuse me. Um, but first, let's talk about digital prototyping for a second. With digital prototyping, uh, you can tap into every stage of your product development process with all the tools Autodesk provides. Uh, we know that, in it, that it touches on four specific areas that you see listed there. Um, improves collaboration with design. Um, it does that by making it easier for the entire team to give input on mechanical design. And um, some of you may know that's involved with the vault. Um, it, it's used for simulating models. Uh, enables you to simulate the product in action so you can uh, make sure that your model that you design performs as you intended it to. Um, instead of doing uh, multiple physical prototypes, you can do um, two or three prototypes digitally and then take it to um, a physical prototype. So it, it limits the number of prototypes, physical prototypes that you're actually producing. Um, you could apply design changes. It lets you make design changes quickly and easily um, and frees you to explore new ideas um, in terms of using different material for your um, model or assembly um, and doing different ideas that, that may come up that you don't want to spend the time or the money doing the prototype, physical prototype, but take it to the digital world. And then also automate processes so you can focus on innovation without extending your product development life cycle. Um, there are so many different aspects of Autodesk software, and sometimes we overlook the capabilities that they offer, and that is what these webcasts are all about. Um, today we're going to introduce you to a portion of the software that you, did, you may not know existed. Um, today we're going to talk about two of those topics, simulating models and applying design changes. Inventor offers um, Inventor offers two add-ins to go along with those two topics, um, frame analysis and then equal material advisor. Uh, today we're going to attempt to answer three questions that you see there on the slide. Um, what does these add-ins do? Uh, why would I need it personally? How is it going to make my production development faster and better? And then also, um, how do I use it? Is it something that's simple? Is it going to take? Am I going to have to take training for it, or is it something that's within Inventor that I can adapt to um, easily? And we'll see that with a couple examples that I'm going to do for you guys. Uh, let's start off with frame analysis. Uh, what does it do? Um, first one, uh, frame analysis most importantly allows you to create a simulation of a real life uh, situation. Um, it does that by adding loads to your frame and constraints at certain points of um, your assembly. Um, which you will see in a little bit is the frame analysis example. Um, it takes your frame and breaks it into uh, line segments um, and points where those lines meet. Um, it does that with the nodes and rigid links, which we'll talk about. After we apply um, a situation to our frame, uh, we can then generate a report and view all of the weak spots in the current design and how to make changes to improve that particular design of our frame. Uh, why would you need it? Um, basically, um, 
it is important to understand your structure integrity. Uh, cases, um, frames may change from one design to the next design, and the frame analysis not only tells you uh, where your frame may fail, but it also pinpoints the exact location at to which your frame may fail by giving you hot spots or giving you uh, thermal readings of where uh, that particular structure may fail. Uh, we can then set expectations of how much weight we want to apply to our structure and hold withhold uh, over a day-to-day -day use of that particular frame. Now, how do we use it? Um, we start off with a design of a frame. Uh, we do that in the frame generator. Uh, within the frame generator, we need to spe specify a uh, particular material. Uh, I don't know if you guys use fra uh, Frame Generator before, but it's another additional add-in um, of Autodesk that allows you to create frames by using the content center materials. Once we have our frame assigned, um, we have our material assigned um, for the frame, we can now take it into the frame analysis um, process. Um, we start off by either adding apply, uh, applied con constraints to our frame or we can start off by applying loads of magnitude to our frame, whether it's one specific load or a continuous load on a beam. And then from there, um, we evaluate our connections, make sure all of the errors are connected, and adjust. And we could do adjust those connections by adding nodes and rigid links um, to better uh, suit for our design intent. And then we do uh, we run a simulation and view the results um, of of the actual frame as far as uh, where those troubled areas are and how we can improve those areas by uh, remodeling our specific frame analysis. Now let's take a closer look. Here we have a structure. Um, And then inside of that structure, you'll see there is a frame. And there are certain areas where I'm going to want to constraint that frame. Uh, you'll see there's going to be a pin constraint there. Um, if I rotate this, hopefully you guys can see this well. But you can see that there's going to be a constraint down here. And then there's also a constraint at this lower section down here. Um, but this, this, is, this would be very difficult to add a frame analysis to this whole assembly. So what I've done is, um, with the frame generator, I've created a separate assembly of my frame. I'm going to go ahead and activate that right now. So now you see that I have my just my uh, frame activated. And this is what um, the, the frame, the inside structure of that frame is going to look like. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to activate our uh, frame analysis atmosphere, if you will not. Um, if we go to, um, if you go to the environments tab, um, can you guys hear me? I see Ryan said that um, it's hard to hear me. All right, just let me know um, in the questions if you guys can't hear me. Okay, so now we're going to start a frame analysis. OK, good. Now we're going to start our frame analysis. And it takes us to the frame analysis atmosphere. Um, and you'll notice that some of the items here are grayed out. And that's because we did not start a new um, simulation yet. So once we select simulation, um, we select a static analysis. And it will take us directly to um, the frame analysis. and all of the icons will populate in regards to editing my particular frame or in adding uh, different things to my um, analysis. Uh, let's talk about what's on the ribbon in the browser for a second. In the ribbon, you'll see that you have different uh, criteria that are required to, to simulate that model. Um, you have to have the material, which we um, designated before, in the frame um, generator. But you can also go through here and, and change your custom material and add a different material type to your frame. Let's close that. And then from there, we have the constraint tab 
uh, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. But basically, these are the different types of constraints that you can add to your specific uh, frame. Uh, remember, at the top here, we had a couple of uh, pivots here. So we're going to want to add a, a floating constraint for uh, those uh, two points that we saw in the um, complete assembly. And then from there, we have our loads, where we can add a, a load onto a particular area. And then we can add a continuous load across a beam. Um, we have connections where we can go through and edit connections. And you'll see how, how that comes into play in a little bit. And we can add custom nodes here and then custom uh, rigid points or rigid links. And then um, here we have our solve and our result. And then um, in the display tab, we can display different items as far as the beam number and then the node label. And then that can verify which uh, nodes are which for your end results and when we pull up that result or export that result into a PDF form. Um, first, I always like to start by um, setting my specific settings. Um, as you can see, the nodes look pretty large and some I have to really zoom in to see some of the rigid links. And then even some of the rigid links are um, hard to see because of the color that's selected. So in order to change some of those things, I can actually go to the frame analysis uh, setting. And then in the frame analysis setting, I can go through and change uh, different things that I want to change. So I'm going to make my node half the size that it is. And then I'm going to change my rigid link to a color that I can see better. So now I can see my rigid links in here. And then you can see that my node size has changed just a little bit. Um, now we're going to um, go through and um, edit some of these rigid links. As you can see here, um, this rigid link comes from this beam here and attaches to this angled beam. But I don't think that will give an accurate result. If I turn it to the side, you'll see that that wouldn't mark a proper weldment point. And it would, it would just give me an incorrect result or a not so accurate result. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually edit that rigid point and uh, apply my own rigid link for um, that particular point. So I could do that by suppressing. I can suppress any rigid link that I need to. And then I'm going to add a custom node. I can either right click here and say um, custom, custom node, or I can go through in the actual um, uh, ribbon here and add a custom node to my beam. So when I select my beam, the area, the node that I'm closest to is the one that it's going to initially offset from. So right now it's at 371 millimeters. I'm going to change that to um, about 374. And then I'm going to apply a rigid link to from that node to the initial node that it was applied to. So now when I rotate this, I can see that my connection is a little bit better as far as how that would correspond to a connection, a weldment connection that would be applied from that direction. Um, I basically did this so that you can see that you can actually go through and you can change different links uh, depending on your model. or So it's not limited to um, what you see there, you, it's always you're always able to um, change links and change nodes depending on your preference or what type of results you're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and do this to the other side here. Um, I'm going to add in a custom node, uh, 374. And then I'm going to add in that rigid link there. Um, also, within your um, structure, sometimes you may have uh, connections that may um, not have gone through. So for example, you'll see, OK, that connection is fine there because it's bringing in, bringing in that um, rigid link from this particular node to this node. But in some connections, because of the way that the, the setup was set, um, you'll see that there are some rigid links that may have not been actually added in. So I'm going to add in my own rigid links to make sure that those connections are, are that go along with my simulation. So 
Okay. So now that I have my rigid links, I have my um, rigid links adjusted, I have my settings adjusted, um, now let's apply some force um, to my model. Actually, let's apply your constraints first, and then we'll apply um, our force to our model. So we'll start off with um, this top beam here, where we saw that there was um, two pivot points at the top there. And then we'll apply those uh, to this top beam. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to constraint. I want a floating constraint off of this beam. But I'm going to right click and say more options so I get it off of that, that wall there because that's where we saw the pivot point. So I'll select direction and I'll select this flat face. And then I'll put the dimension, which um, I know is to be 116 from that point. All right. And then I'll add another floating point. And then I'll make that one to be 964 from that point. So now I have two um, constraints at the top there. Um, I want to add, uh, remember I want to add one down here at the bottom, or I want to add one at each beam. Um, I'm going to add a custom, um, a custom constraint because I want it to be able to move in the x direction to see what kind of bend factor I get but I don't want it to move in the Y or um, Z direction. So I want to add a custom um, node in there, or a custom constraint in there. So I select this beam, and then I say, okay, I, want, I don't want X to be fixed. I want it to have um, some elasticity. So then um, I apply that, and then I apply how far from the bottom I want that to be. I also do that to the opposite side. So now I have two. I have two at the bottom, two constraint, custom constraints. I have two at the top, which are floating constraints. And then now I want to add one more across the bottom here. And I also want to add another um, floating constraint across the bottom here. So I select that bottom. Let's do that again. I add a floating constraint, and I want to add that across the bottom here. Go to Options, and then I want that to be relative to where it is right now. So round that up to 0.5. So oh, let's edit this. Okay, let's change the direction of that. Okay. Now that we have our constraints, let's apply a force, a couple of forces to our particular model. We'll notice that the, automatically the load that is applied is uh, gravity, but we want it to go in the opposite direction. So what we'll do here is we'll edit the gravity in the browser under load, and then we'll change the direction of, of which that uh, particular load is going. And then we're going to apply a couple more forces, so we'll apply one on this node at 100 newtons, and then we'll apply another one at this node. And then we want to apply one more across the beam, but we want that to be all across the beam, so we're going to use the continuous load option. And then we'll put that at 0.5. Okay, and now that we have our force, we have our load, we have our constraints, and we have all of our rigid links adjusted. We have everything that we need. We can now run that simulation. Now, as you can see, um, the first thing that comes up is it shows you, I don't know if you can see that clearly up there, but it shows you the type of result that came up first. It's always default, which is uh, the displacement. So it shows you the displacement as far as um, what type of torsion that, that occurs when you apply that force across that angle beam. Um, you'll see you can also do an animation where it shows you um, just a short clip of what's going on after you apply 
of that force across those beams. Now you can see there is I, I added um, what I did is remember I made sure that it was able to go in the x direction but not in the y or z direction. So you'll see that it's able to pivot from that point and still go into that direction. So I can see what type of um, impact is applied when I apply that force across those beams. Um, that's one way of looking at some of the uh, results, which we can also do. Uh, we generate a report, which we'll do in a little bit, but there's also a beam detail where we can go through and look at some of the results for each specific beam. So if I wanted just the result of this top beam here, um, I can select, um, select beam, and then it'll show me um, all of the corresponding um, selections that I can go through um, based off of that particular beam. So I, if I wanted to go to the max, it'll give me, it'll show me the normal stress max of that particular beam and where it's located corresponding to the diagram that's at the top there. And then you, as you can see, I can also go to uh, torsional stress and you see that there's none there because of the fact that um, we added those pivot points there. Now if I went to wanted to select a different beam, I can select that mean, and now you can see there's a torsion because of the weldment spot and where we edit that specific rigid point. Now you can see that there's a uh, torsion stress off of that particular area. And I can also go to the, to the stress max of that particular beam. So you can, you can um, see that it gives you the option of looking through each individual uh, beam, and then it also gives you the option uh, to see a full view of you know, where the max displacement is or um, color-coded by, by this diagram here, and it tells you what's going on with your particular structure. Um, now, you can also go through and um, go through the option of um, doing a beam diagram where you can select, and it gives you a, a real-life view as far as a diagram of, of each individual beam. Um, if, I, if I want to select one particular one and I select what I want to display, it will show me that by, by these diagrams in my actual um, model here. And then it will show me my max area and then my min area. And then you can go through here and select any one that you want and, and it will pop up automatically by showing you a diagram off of that particular um, beam that you select. Along with that, that's not the only type of result, but the one that's used mostly is uh, the fact that we can generate a report. Now, if you guys have done any type of simulation within um, Autodesk Inventor, you know that you're able to you're able to generate a report based off of um, the simulation, and it gives you tons and tons of information uh, that you can go off of. Um, it summarizes your frame analysis. Um, it gives you, you know, your pro your project file as far as, you know, what it was created, who it was created by, um, all the specifications as far as weight, area, and then it, then it goes into the simulation process. So if you have more than one simulation, that would populate into there too, and then you can go through and see, you know, what type of material I use, um, the cross section of my material, the beam model, the rigid links, the ones that I've added to my a particular one, and this is where um, the beam number and the node number comes in handy, because this is where you can say, okay, I specify, oh, I know that that was node number 23, now I can look and see, okay, was that fixed or was that had, was that not fixed? And I can go through and it gives me gravity, and then it goes through and gives us uh, each individual force that was applied to our structure, and, and then um, the continuous load, and then each individual constraint that was applied. So as you can see, it gives you tons and tons of detail as far as uh, results for your frame analysis. And you can go through here and say, OK, these, these are the areas where we need to improve. And you could document this and, and put it in your actual report. 
So that's just a little bit of a run through on the frame analysis. I mean, of course, there's, a, there's tons more that you can do. Um, and, you know, we, you can always, I'm going to put up my email so you can ask questions afterwards um, if it's more detailed oriented stuff that you're wanting to know. All right, let's go back to the slide here. Um, now that we talked about frame analysis, let's talk a little bit about Equal Material Advisor. Um, Equal Material Advisor was introduced into Inventor in 2012 um, edition, and um, it kind of, we're going to go into detail exactly what it does and, and how it works. So we're going to attempt to answer those three questions again. Um, what does it do? Equal Material Advisor was um, touches on some of the behind the scenes, I would say, features that are important in product development. Um, it enables better decisions early in the design stage, and then it also helps keep your design under in, inter, in environmental regulations. It allows an engineer to apply materials to the product of, um, to analyze the impact that the particular material has on that assembly, and then you can adjust your material um, so that you can have better costs, you can have um, uh, better environmental regulations, you can follow those regulations, and whatnot. Why do you need it? Uh, basically, why do you need it kind of falls in line with what does it do. Um, it identifies hot spots in your assembly. So say if you have a large assembly, you, know, you don't know particularly without this application you may have an idea of where most of the cost is going to or where the product development impact is mostly on the on the particular part of my assembly. But this kind of gives you detail as far as um, how far does it uh, impact your your assembly. Your assembly, but not, not just on the aspects of where the assembly may fail, but the cost of manufacturing that product. It also touches on what kind of impact manufacturing of that product will have on the environment. Then it allows you to make alterations to your assembly by switching out materials that will help these potential hot spots. Now, how do you use it? We start off with the initial design concept. So you have your initial assembly, and then you identify where some of those hot spots are with the uh, equal hotspot, um, it identifies those particular hotspots. Um, whether it be for cost or energy consum consumption of manufacturing that product, we then set a point of areas we want, to, we want our product to improve in by setting a baseline. From there, um, we use the eco to search through alternative materials, which is a cloud-based um, option where it gives you tons of materials. So you have to make sure that you're connected to the internet and you're logged in and able to use your, your cloud-based material list. And then you test the alternatives and integrate those materials to make a new assembly. So you're, it's pretty much you're swapping out uh, materials based on your set baseline of criteria of what goals you want to meet on your particular um, assembly. Now, let's take a closer look. Now, here we have a door. Um, in this example, we have been given some guidelines about the design requirements and came up with our first design concept. So this is our first design concept. Um, is It's a door, it's a wooden door, um, it has a stainless steel door knob. Um, for the glass, for the uh, window, we use a polycarbonate window. And the hinges have not been assigned a material yet, and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, now, in order to access your equal material advisor, um, it's in the environments tab. And then you'll see an icon that says equal material advisor. Now you notice the first thing you'll notice at the top right here when you open the Eco Material Advisor is your basic toolbar. Um, we are going to begin with the graph icon, 
and then uh, this this will pull up a dashboard. It's called the Equal Impact Dashboard. Uh, this dashboard is used to identify where um, equal hotspots are located in our assembly, and it works by setting a baseline for our design, then gives us the capability to search for recommended recommended materials that can lower the equal hotspots of our assembly. Now that you'll notice down here, uh, there's an X here, and that's, that tells us that there's something going on with our assembly, uh, whether that be um, that um, the ROHS compliancy is not right, or there are certain materials within our assembly that have not been assigned, um, or certain parts in our assembly that have not been assigned a material. So if we click on this X, And, and we'll see that, okay, um, these materials have not been assigned a material. So if I, if I click that and I say select part, it'll show me that, okay, all these hinges have not been assigned a material. If I can right click that and say browse for materials, and it'll give me a list of materials that, I can, that are typically used for hinges or for that particular part. So in this case, I'm going to use a um, a bronze cast, and then we're going to uh, assign that to the part. Okay. So now we see a check mark there. Um, because we selected that specific part, we need to go back to activate our entire assembly now. So now we're going to go back to the top here, and we're going to say return to top. So that returns to our entire assembly, and then that updates our um, Eco Impact dashboard again. Now let's start by seeing what type of impact our material is having on our assembly. So if we uh, select any one of these, let's see, let's select uh, carbon footprint, and then we'll see As you can see, the carbon footprint usage of our window is pretty high, and that's indicated um, by this being highlighted red, so that tells us that's a hot spot area. Um, and we can go back and even, uh, if we hit select this to view summary again, we can go back and say, okay, I want to select energy. Uh, we could do that way, or we can actually toggle through these and see what type of um, impact is on each. It goes through the list of that you saw on the home page there, and it shows you, you know, water usage, cost. Um, the highest cost material there is the window, and it shows you the total cost of the entire assembly. So now if we go back to that home page now. Um, now let's um, actually see what type of material we can use to alter that window to make it um, not a hot spot or make it a better material to use as a window. So if we click that and we say, okay, select part, now we can see what type of material is being used for that window. It's a polycarbonate, and um, we can click on that and say, okay, I want to view the data sheet for that particular um, material. So when you do that, it pulls up a PDF form of that particular material, and then it shows you what we need, what's most important is the par primary, primary, primary material product production. So it shows you energy, um, the CO2, and then the water usage. And we can, we're going to use that to set our baseline as far as where we want to improve in order to give us um, a suggestion of what material we should use for that window. So now if we go back to this home page here and we go to set baseline, what that does, it automatically sets a baseline so we can compare and contrast when we add in our new material and we change this uh, to the suggested material. Now let's go back to here and say, okay, I want to select my window and I want to search for alternative materials to um, for my polycarbonate current window and see what kind of improvement I can get. So here we have our search criteria as far as uh, what we want specifically our, our 
material or a part to do. So first thing I'm going to do is, okay, I want this to be transparent because I need to see through that particular mirror. Um, density doesn't really matter to me, so I'm going to um, cancel that. And if I pull this PDF back up, um, we have some, we can use these as like a benchmark of where, uh, where we don't want to be. So we can say, okay, um, CO2 carbon footprint, theirs is at 5.7 to 6.4 here, and we want to change that to be um, below that. So we'll change that to 5. So these are just suggested um, um, ideas of, you know, where you want to be. It's not something that's, you know, that you know for sure, but it's where you, you know that you want to be below what you have there, so you actually go through and select what you want um, improvements in. So um, embodied energy, uh, we, it's at 100, so we'll put ours at about 90. Uh, the price point, the price point was okay, so we'll keep that at a 90, at 90. And then um, we don't need tensile strength. And then for water usage, we don't need the yield strength. We don't need... Um, so the last thing we're going to adjust is the water usage. So we're going to change that to about 150 to be just a little bit below uh, the initial. So now if we go to search now, it shows you that there's no materials have been added to the search criteria. So let's redefine our search. OK, so carbon footprint. Um, embodied energy, price point, water usage. Let's see. It should There we go. Spelled transparent incorrectly. Um, it should show up, you know, what uh, materials that we have for that would be better than the initial polycarbonate that we use. So let's just use the first one there. Let's use glass, and we'll find that to selected part. And then once you do that, the dashboard will automatically update, and it'll show you the type of improvement you get from replacing the polycarbonate material to the glass material. So as far as cost, we get a 34% increase, I mean a decrease in cost. Um, for water usage, we get about an 83% decrease. A carbon footprint, 74% decrease, as you can see there. And then the energy usage, we get about an 80% decrease. Now this is, keep in mind, this is just for that particular part, what type of improvements. But if we go again, we go back up and return to um, the top portion of our assembly, we'll also see what type of um, improvement we get on our assembly. So it, as far as cost on the entire assembly, we get a 16% increase. Uh, water usage, we get a 5% increase. Uh, carbon footprint, we get a 41% increase. And then energy usage, we get a 50% increase. Now, um, results here, it gives you results as far as what type of improvements you've, you've received, but you also have the option of going through, um, if you select um, view reports, it populates a report just as if we were um, to do, it should populate a report. Let's see here. It, it, just as if we were to do in our simulation processes. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, and then we're going to do a um, impact comparison, and we're going to see view that report as a PDF. Now you'll see that it gives us a comparison report. And if you scroll down here, it shows you the content of the particular report. 
And then we could start off by seeing the overview change compared to the baseline. So remember again, we set our baseline and then we compare it to the initial um, material that we assign to that product or to that part. And then we see what type of reduction we get changing that product. So that's the whole idea behind um, the equal material advisor where it compares and contrasts the, the two different uh, materials that you can apply to a particular um, part. And if we keep scrolling through, it gives us different graphs that we can use for documentation or if you want to take those reports to your boss and say, okay, uh, this is the type of improvement that I'm going to see if we switch our, our materials from um, this product to this product. And then it gives you uh, a new concept chain <coughs> and then the print uh, percentage of um, reduction that you give with the new product. Um, gives you, you know, it gives you a graph for each individual product, water usage, uh, the cost summary. So this is just an overview of, you know, what's going on with that material and, and, and it tells you um, what type of improvements that you get if you swap out that material with a new product. Um, this is also a good one to read about, the Appendix A, um, how are these figures calculated. So it goes behind the scenes and tells you, you know, how does it pick um, a particular material and how does it know that the cost of that material and how to re replace that material for a um, product. All right. So it's basically an overview of both. Um, objects and it, and it tells you, you know, kind of where to go. Um, that's just a, you know, a, a step forward, like we can always go into more detail as far as, you know, if you have more questions, uh, you can send me an email at marvinthomas at hagerman.com. Uh, right now we're going to open the floor for some questions. I see we have a question already. Um, so we're just going to give it some time um, and then we're going to answer some of these questions and then we'll follow up with um, closing this session. Um, to answer your question, Mark, um, Mark basically says he needs to learn more, or we, I need to learn more about frame analysis. Uh, we often design a building tunnel for mining industries using beam, beams and plates. Um, that's um, in more detail. I mean, you can shoot me an email, and then I can have um, somebody contact you. We actually do, we have classes for that, or um, I can give you a little bit more detail as far as a, of a more thorough a run through of uh, frame analysis and how it works. Keep it open a little bit longer for some more questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and, and and put your questions in the question dashboard. Um, if somebody asks, is frame analysis available for Inventor 2012? Yes, it is. Uh, do I have any more links uh, to any more examples on frame analysis. Ryan, you can shoot me an email and I can send you tons of material. Uh, just tell me that you, you know, what you're looking for and, and, and I can send you more material on that. Um, Gary, what kind of analysis engine is used? Do you use shear center or centroid? for open sections like C channels. Um, that I do not know off the top of my head, but um, I can get you more information on that if you shoot me an email. Um, Julia asks, is there a way to use frame generator and um, 
analysis with lumber? Yeah, you actually can. Um, you can you specify it as a lumber instead, or as a wood instead of a actual, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a metal. So when you pick your materials, you can actually pick a wood instead of a, a metal. Keep it open a couple of more minutes here for questions. Um, how do you check joints like bolts, welds, etc.? cetera? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, uh, Gary. Um, you can use rigid links to apply a joint. So uh, if you would have a weld mint at a certain area, like you saw that I added that rigid link, that would specify, um, you know, as an area that's using a weld mint or a joint, I guess. If that answers your question, just let me know. If it doesn't, then I can um, address it further. Um, how do you get information for setting up a yield, setting up yield properties? Um, with Inventor, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but we have um, each particular part. You can actually, um, you can, you have a couple of options. You can go through and create your own material and set up yield strength. Uh, you can set up yield properties. Uh, you can set up any type of properties, or you can go through and actually um, edit a material and say, okay. Um, I want to save this as a new material, but with this yield strength. So you can do that and then apply it to your frame or apply it to a, a part and then say, okay, I want that material to be applied to that part, and then it'll use that yield strength that you set up for that material that you created um, in your materials list, and then um, it'll adapt to that. Um, Gary said, to go further with his questions, with his question he said, do you check loads on bolt patterns, tensions on welds, or other critical cases? Um, based off of my knowledge, I, it doesn't factor in weldments. That would be very difficult. That would be more of like a, a, a stress analysis where it, it calculates all the mesh points. So that's where it would, it would you know, be more beneficial. It would grab but as far as for um, frame analysis, that wouldn't take well mints or uh, or, t or uh, bolts bolt turns and cons into consideration. Julia asked. Julia asked um, that she has not found it easy. Finally, easy to specify standard lumber sizes and frame generator. Is there a way or a group where these are? Um, you can use, um, I'm, I'm thinking the content center. Uh, you can adjust the size there. You can actually add custom sizes there if you don't find what you need. But you can always send me an email, Julia, and then I can go into more detail as far as searching that for you and uh, helping you out there. Um, Mike, I don't really understand your question. Uh, you said that you said that um, they need to get up and running with Autodesk Inventor Professional Part One. Um, I'm sorry, Mike. I don't understand. I mean, if you shoot me an email, I can address your question. Are you, are you saying that you need a, a class or a book um, if we supply books or classes? Uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. I, I don't understand. Uh, you can shoot me an email, and I can answer. You know, I can call you, or we can talk directly as far as what you're looking for. I'm not sure if you're looking for a book or if you're looking for an inventor class. I'll take a couple more questions here. Oh, I think Mike is saying that uh, it's beneficial if you guys get a book called Up and Running with Autodesk Inventor Professional Part 1. And that kind of helps you with um, some of the objects that we talked about, like a prereq for um, some of the material that we were talking about. And it kind of goes um, with um, some of the frame analysis and equal material advisor. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mark says, uh, to answer your question, Julia, uh, when creating a frame, you can select the material. And then we can go into more detail about that also, um, Julia, if you shoot me an email. Thank you, Mark. Take a couple more questions here. I mean, I'd say the best thing for you guys to do, just my input, is um, kind of explore Inventor. There's tons of different types of add-ins and applications um, that are involved in Inventor, and it's very useful to kind of explore it and see you know, how it may be beneficial to your industry. Um, I've witnessed so many times where people, you know, they do more work than necessary because they're used to that way, that method that way, but there's so many different, you know, applications that are within Inventor, even free applications that kind of, you know, address certain issues you have and make, you know, your productivity and development process a lot faster and better. Give you guys about five more minutes if you have any more questions, and then we'll close this out. Um, how, uh, Dim Dimiru? I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, he asked, how can we translate or convert? from SOLIDWORKS to Inventor? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, SOLIDWORKS, converting from SOLIDWORKS to Inventor is not a, uh, a difficult task, but it doesn't give you all of the features. Basically, with an assembly, you can convert a SOLIDWORKS assembly uh, to a step file, and that will report that particular um, uh, file. You'll have that file on hand, but you can't go into that particular process that was that was made to create that assembly to to edit those changes so you can't make changes to the assembly so you pretty much have the model you can add additions to that model it'll come at as a part not an assembly but you can't make any changes so as far as translating to um, um, frame analysis or equal material advisor frame analysis I believe it can I would have to double check on that but equal materials I'm, sh I'm sure it can because you can change the materials of a step file. Good question.
Any more questions, guys? All right. If you don't have any more questions, then I'm going to go ahead and um, and end this broadcast. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I hope you guys picked up something. I hope you guys learned something. And if you have any questions, once again, um, I'm going to put my email up here so you can see. But if you have any questions, once again, don't hesitate to um, shoot me an email. And I can do, I'll do the best I can to you know, even get you any type of information or get you any type of instructions on what you need. Um, we also offer training. So if you guys are ever interested in any training sessions, um, we can also get you in contact with um, somebody from Hangerman to um, get you on the list for the training. We do remote training, um, just like these go-to meetings. And then we also do um, um, on-site training. And we have 22 locations. So thanks again, everybody. Um, have a good day. If you don't have any more questions, then I'm going to go ahead and end this broadcast.